Hi, I'm Bill Babcock, nephew of Jim Hugan. Jim Hugan has been searching for Bigfoot for about 40 years. Back in the early 70s, I had camped out at the Shafter Lake campground with my dog named Fluffy. My dog looked like Benji. I woke up when the, my dog was barking towards the forest and I have heard shuffling in the forest. I wasn't sure if there was a bear or a Bigfoot out there. I didn't see what was there. After the shuffling sound stopped, my dog stopped barking for a minute. After that, I saw a ghostly figure going up through the trees and my dog barked wildly until ghostly figure vanished. I didn't sense that this was an evil. I have heard that Bigfoot is a multidimensional being, and Mount Shasta is known to be for UFO activity. And this could be also a sacred area. I did a crystal pendulum test which swings for yes, for like back and forth one direction, or no, for the back and forth other direction. And the answer comes out from, uh, from my subconscious mind. I got yes as Bigfoot was out in the forest, even I didn't see it. My Uncle Jim had camped out many times to see if they are out there at the Pacific Northwest. He hadn't seen Bigfoot throughout those years. He had written a couple articles on Bigfoot on Cryptozoology magazine, and he was on the, one of the TV series In Search Of, hosted by Leonard Nimoy, and his topic was Bigfoot. He had cast on Bigfoot print. This is a photo of me holding Bigfoot cast. He did lecture on Bigfoot at Portland Community College at Sylvania campus sometimes in the early 90s. I am presenting this video of Jim Hukin, which is at Portland Community College, which was taken by Richard Rip Little. One thing I know that is real uh, interesting about this animal that we're talking about distribution and habitat, ecological niche and everything else. This animal seems to have it over anything else. It's a primate, unlike any other primate, except it's closer to us than anything else because we utilize habitat. <coughs> we get out and we utilize all the habitat there is because we improvise. We do things with tools and so we can take good use of it. This animal does it on its own without tools. He's a good swimmer, he can feed underwater, swim underwater, and swim the strongest rivers and biggest lakes. He's off the offshore islands in Canada, and Queen Charlotte's, Vancouver Island, all across this country. The habitat is mountainous. Probably the part of his habitat is the mountain ranges, where he's probably forced in prehistoric times by primitive man with his weapons and his organization, which is kind of loose in those days, but probably forced him into uh, areas that were food was hard to get at, rougher country. And so he developed into a big, strong, monstrous creature. He can do anything. He's got it all made for himself. He can pull down big game, elk, deer, mountain goats, rabbits. He's so fast, quick, that he can you know, just about do anything he wants to do. And in spite of his 800 pounds or whatever it is, 900. 550, whatever you want to call it. Young ones are probably faster yet. <laughs> anyway, Rip, have you got a, a slide of that one thing I have there? I want to, to grab. I want to show the muscles on the arm, on the upper arm of that the female. That's what the pattern of the future is. I may not show it.
you've got to see we might have to pass this around. Yeah, let's just show the other one if you have it handy. Uh, the reason I wanted to see that, if we could possibly look at it you know, on the screen and get it enlarged a little bit, was because it shows this female striding along and her right arm extended this way. The triceps muscles are very evident. It seems like it's as in focus as it was last week. Now we've got a breakdown on that. Well, we'll forget about it. Uh, in order for, um, for these animals, in order for these animals to be as agile, quick, maneuverable, and strong as they are, they have to have a particular physique as rugged, and this particular animal shows all of those traits. That's why I wanted to show it. You've seen it before. I know you have on the, in the movies once in a while. But it's heavy throughout the arms and thighs and legs, right across the pelvic area. Uh, they need a real massive pelvic area to support the back and muscles that's necessary to keep it an upright animal and still have the speed and strength to survive. And, and get a living. This is the one that, this, this is the famous one that should look right at the camera that Patterson is taking the picture. Uh, but then you can see that the heavy weight right in here, right in the, right in the lower part of the rump area and the thighs, that would be very well muscled in order to bring down a deer and an elk. Yeah, or any kind of an animal like a rabbit popping all around and can scoop it right up. What makes us realize that this is sold is because some of the reports we get, and we have to go by reports. I can't hear you, Jim. How's that? Okay. Some reports indicate that they've been eating rabbits, catch snowshoe rabbits. Uh, they can catch a dog. A pack of dogs hasn't got a chance. This shows very, very, very quick, strong quickness because a pack of dogs can escape from a cougar or a, or a bear normally. But this animal can catch a dog and rip it in half from head to stern with just one motion. So you know you have a real deadly animal out there running around that's not going to be fooled around with. It. That probably tells us another thing. That's why we haven't got one in the museum somewhere. Yeah. No one can, and it's not good enough to okay. forget about it. Yeah. Um, I recently had a report, or I interviewed a man that had a bizarre experience in northwest Montana about 10 years ago. He operates a small cattle ranch over there at the time. Uh, he lives in Washington now, Richfield. Which, uh, he told about a fishing expedition where he was hiking into it one morning and was having it at night before daylight. And before he got to his fishing uh, location, he had to cross through a meadow and he stopped to look around because it's a good place to see moose. And about that time, a deer came crashing out into the meadow and stopped. Just stopped. He thought it saw him, so it stopped. And then he heard this. Kelly Stream, Dr. Farnbeck mentioned the scream. Um, tremendous scream. And then this long legged gorilla walked out of the, it came striding out of the brush and uh, took about four or five strides, grabbed the deer right by the head. The deer didn't move and held it straight up. And he could, he could hear the bones breaking at the deer's neck. He thought it was biting its neck, but he said he didn't see any teeth. And then he looked around, he was growling all the time, looking around and growling, and holding the deer straight up. And he slumped down in the grass. He had his backpack with him, his fishing outfit, the camera in his backpack. He wasn't about to do anything, he was scared stiff, which was normal. And uh, the animal then just Grabbed it by the nose, grabbed the deer by the nose, and threw it over its shoulder and walked away, back in the woods where it came from. 
Now that's so bizarre, you kind of wonder, what in the heck? But this guy is a very credible person. He served as a merchant marine during World War II. And then he, after that was over with, he worked in the Peace Corps and the Vista program over in Africa for two or three sessions. And he'd been around a lot, got a good background. So we you have a hard time believing something like that. But I kind of think, I think it's just a good report. He may have a few observations turned around a little bit, but it sounds like, but if it's true, it tells you how strong these animals are and what they can do. And uh, another incident, I remember interviewed a fellow two years ago that I saw one capture a fawn deer. And it happened so fast that the doe didn't even know what happened. She was standing right there in front of the observer. They were feeding in a meadow. And the fawn wandered over towards the edge of the meadow. And, and then this is a flash. It just jumped right out in one step, grabbed the fawn, and jumped back from the ground. And um, he heard the fawn bleat, squeal a little bit, but soon he got the rest of it all quiet. And uh, the, the doe, it happened so fast, the doe saw him on the stump. And uh, just looked at him, and he see the animal, he see the, the accident happen. And he thought it was a bear at the time when he got home, he told his wife, the first thing he said he got in the house, is that was not a bear. Because <laughs> it was standing on two legs or something, and it had hands. So that's the way a lot of these reports go. And this thought didn't tell anybody until about 12 years ago, about when I got wind of it. And uh, these, these here, Reports are always late. You can't get on anything that's quick enough to really follow up and find tracks or find evidence what else is going on. If you can find what's going on, you can learn something. But uh, 10 days, two years, four, four or five years, boy, that's so far gone, you can't get anything out of it. Uh, I lucked out on one report over here at the Cascade. It's just out of a forest road a few miles. A few years ago, about five or six years ago, a fellow called me and said, uh, I'm going on a motorbike and saw one standing in the road. You mean the coastal? The logging road. You mean the coastal? No. Cascade? Uh, Coast Range, yeah, I was right. Between, between Telemuck and Forest Road. And uh, so I went up there with him and we had to wait on the motorcycles to get there at the block gate. That's how his kid got in there. He loved the motorcycles behind the block gate. These kids, they get all the country on their motorcycles and you can't stop and they're in there all the time running back up and down all these roads and mountains. And that's what he was doing. He was coming back. He was alone and pretty close to the, uh, about three miles from the gate. He'd come around the corner, curve, up downhill slope, about 100 yards. It's just a big man walking across the road. Dark, a little dark color. And it was getting late, but it was still daylight. And he just walked across the road and took a few step in the brush. Well, he kind of slowed down and he got kind of queasy about it, too, because he said, that just so funny. And, and he got to where it went in the brush, he looked over his shoulder, and the brush was going like this. And he went on home. He got to be good and went on home and got out of there. And then uh, he told his dad, his mother, his neighbor. The neighbors went to me up there. That was two weeks later by the time I got up there. And we found the tracks. Uh, there were big tracks. Um, it was compared with these tracks right here. You couldn't, you couldn't cast them, but this is about the same size of the track that that was. And this is, uh, I took this over to the Cascade. And it shows the widespread toes. That's what this one showed in the, in the duff, where it went across the road and brushed there, real heavy brush. There's a big log there, and you can see where it went along next to the log. And it made a move, which is, uh, tell you something. It didn't just go in the brush and keep on going and hiding. He went towards the kid. The kid's coming down the road on his motorcycle. And he's 30 foot in the brush in the road. He's big log there. He goes right, right towards the kid, about 30 feet. And he stops, gets to the end of the log, and he jams his foot, one foot in the ground, went like this, and he looked at the kid and he goes by. Oh, he couldn't see him. He was so thick. But I guess it shows you what these animals do. See, he wasn't afraid of anything. He'd be mad at that kid, probably, because of that noisy motorcycle. <clears throat> and uh, when, he, when the kid got there, he 
reached over eight feet between two little hemlock trees, both of them snapped. And one snapped this way, and one snapped that way. Eight feet between them, and from the front foot. So he was crouched over like this. And by looking at the prints in the, in the dump there, you can tell what had happened. And then apparently, he said, there was no prints showing where he left. That was it. When he walked away, he didn't leave any tracks. And I'm convinced that these animals very seldom show tracks to be looked at. They're pretty smart. I think when they leave tracks, they're not conscious of anybody being around and just having a situation where they have to leave tracks sometimes. <coughs> and uh, the average, uh, the average uh, stride or pace, I say pace, stride is like uh, two steps on the same foot. Pace is just a step. The average pace of a mature cosmos is about 50 inches, between 4 feet and 50 inches. That's about what I've been going by. I've only seen two tracks that I can measure. I mean, two different sets of tracks that I can measure. There's about maybe a couple of hundred prints all together. And other times I just found the same track and can't measure any kind of pace or anything. And the maximum pace was 109 inches. In the same same line of tracks. Now that's, that tells you how strong they are without even making an effort. They're just walking along. He wants to jump over something, he jumps. He steps over. He stepped over the trash and broken down trees. And there was the other side. That's the longest pace he made. The shortest pace was 28 inches. And that was where he stopped by a tree, which is logical, right? Stopped by a tree, you look around. You can't see your body when you're by a tree. These animals are masters of camouflage and concealing themselves. And that's why nobody sees them very often. Whenever anybody ever sees someone, it's generally their grandmother or somebody in a tent camping somewhere, somebody fishing, or driving down the highway, one crosses in front of them. You're out in the woods, you're not going to see them. Because they're going to see you first. Often you see a cougar, you don't see a cougar. They see you first. And, uh, so they're uh, an animal that has really got everything going for them. My, in my opinion, the animal is all year round active and he takes in the whole environment. From the top of the highest mountains down to the sea level, every kind of an ecological niche we have, he can go through and enjoy it. Lakes, ponds, bogs, swamps, meadows, Anywhere where there's something to eat, and you eat it. Vegetation, there's there, there no need grass, tender grass roots. Yes? I think it could defend itself uh, with a wolf pack or a big grizzly. Wolf pack? Or a grizzly. Well, as the biggest animal is, you shouldn't be afraid of anything on the land. Uh, he's as big as a grizzly, if not bigger. Uh, a big grizzly weighs 800 to 1,000 pounds. And uh, when you look at the, the body form of a Bigfoot, say eight feet for a grizzly standing up, a big one. And you put an eight foot Bigfoot next to him. He's bigger than that grizzly. He's eight feet tall. Because he hasn't got a neck. Not much of that grizzly's neck. But Bigfoot's just head and then shoulders. And the grizzly hasn't got any shoulders. It's like this. The paws are in front. There's no shoulders. No mass up here for the chest. He's just big all over, so he's got a couple. He's probably got 500 pounds right there that Grizzly hasn't got. And uh, there's a big difference. And he, besides that, he's faster than a Grizzly. A Grizzly can't catch a dog. This animal can catch a dog. It's just snatch him up and go from my effort at all. So in a battle, I would. I would favor the put money on the Bigfoot. But then we don't know how they and I think in the actual wild they probably avoid each other. Most wild animals do that. They avoid each other. You probably never hear of a or anything. But I have a real strange report from the Blue Mountains where somebody found two dead cougars with bastion heads. And I get wild enough. Cougars. Cougars. Two two full grown cougars with bastion heads. Well, I couldn't follow it up because I couldn't find out who took the picture, and I couldn't 
find out who the Cooper the book, the word of mouth with it, that the writer for the Forest Service who lives near the girl, the founder. And uh, if that had happened as a result of a Bigfoot encounter, it was probably over a, a deer kill or an elk kill. Cooper probably made a kill and the Bigfoot took it away from him. Uh, I would think so because we have, uh, we have a record uh, people that say they have been bucked away by Bigfoots when they shot a deer. Uh, the deer. And uh, I believe that. I can believe that. And we have records of sitting up, sealing out, stealing out from camps and from out in the woods when you leave more night. Before you can pack them out with a the horse, but they're, they're gone the next day. As a matter of fact, this one hunter told me that uh, it was dragged and carried down the canyon a quarter of a mile. They found it down there with the tag still on it and the come along cable still on the elk. And when they, they packed it out on horses, and, uh, during the time they packed it out, it was, it was screaming. You could hear it screaming out in the woods. <coughs> so there you go. Uh, the bizarre stories all over the place. You don't know how to believe some of them, but this gave them almost a first hand first hand story. It's kind of great. There is one report of a dead grizzly from um, Montana possibly done by Bigfoot. Black bears, we just had a report come in from over where you were talking about, uh, up near Gold Day area. Yeah, right. And it just all torn to pieces inside of a 30 foot flattened area. There again, the same thing. It might have been eating a dead deer or something that something else wanted. Yeah. And another case down in Coos Bay, one was hanging in a tree with a Bigfoot guardian. It was food. That was a black bear again. Yeah, well, there's all kinds of reports. There. These these animals are definitely associated with meat, uh, game animals. They like to hang out. With, there's a lot of wildlife, and uh, this, uh, uh, the message I get from most people is that when there's one around, everything's quiet. The birds don't chirp. Nothing, you can't hear nothing. Well, of course, I've been in woods lots of times and I couldn't hear anything, especially old growth forest. It was real quiet. Uh, second, second growth forest is uh, is generally a different story. There's, there's more animals in second growth, it seems like. There's more kinds, of, there's more kinds of vegetation too. And here's another, there's another uh, aspect of the distribution of these animals. Uh, most of them that you hear about now are found in second growth forest. Of course, that's because there's so much second growth now. Almost half the country is in second growth, more than that. And uh, that kind of Makes you wonder. Uh, see, second growth has got more food in it than old growth has for some animals, and there's more more wildlife taking advantage of it. And then old growth has its own category of, uh, of uh, organisms that's uh, unique, and there's a, we don't know much about that. And how much the uh, uh, Sasquatches depend on that? Because they probably depend on that a lot before logging took over. Logging is a big change, and I think one has to. Uh, Think about in the distribution of this animal about how things have changed over the last hundred years, how the landscape has changed. We haven't got the old growth forest here like we used to, but the animal was here. He was in the old growth. Now he's in the second growth, and he's probably better off. He might be better off now than he was before we got this. We don't know that, but we have a lot more animals now in, in some respects. More elk, more deer, and uh, well, something that's gone downhill is the fisheries. And there are a few other animals that are less than we used to be in numbers, but uh, it's a, in one respect, uh, when you think about this animal, we got to think about what it was like 100 years ago, too, and just make comparison. We didn't, we didn't see them 100 years ago because there was no access to the habitat back there. Uh, now we have roads everywhere and fragmented forest, so fragmented that you can just go anywhere and be within a few miles of another road. So why are we seeing so many of these animals? These would be more evident. He's going to be crossing a road sometime, or someone's going to see him doing something while he's fishing. Or whatever. Uh, and these animals are not really, uh, they're almost like a human in some respects. Uh, I have a report from a fellow that was fishing up on the uh, back of years ago. And a big bear came up behind him and chased him down to his car. Well, he was on two legs. This happened several years ago before Bigfoot was banged around in possible work. Um, he ran and ran and was right behind him and he fell down and then he walked up and just stayed there and looked at him. 
he jumped up and went and got to his car. And he got home. And he told everybody it was a bear. Now he, he, said, he tells everybody it's a Bigfoot. <laughs> because it's on two legs. 70% of all sightings come from cars at night. Cars, a lot of automobiles uh, at night. The daytime, we're seeing the daytime too, but uh, they're nocturnal, but they have the ability to feed in the daytime also. And so that's a, that's a real good asset for an animal that's going to be a survivor like he is and be a monster and still be unknown to science or unrecognized. Um, you can't blame the scientists in a way because they haven't got any bones to look at or any body or muscle of any kind. And they aren't going to believe any. I could probably take the best picture in the world of one that would believe it. Um, yes? Well, how far can a bear walk on its hind feet, and when does a bear far. usually they walk on its not known to walk, walk very far at all. When do they usually do that, though, if they do? Well, I've never seen one walk on its hind feet, but I don't think I've seen one stand straight up. Well, I, that's the question I guess I'm getting at. When they usually stand up is when they're... When they're curious, they'll stand straight up and they'll look around. You know, they hear something or they see something, they don't know what it is, they'll stand up sometimes. And I've seen a bear stand up when I drove up to it on a lobby road. And car came up, turned around, stood up, checked me out, dropped back down to all fours. That's, that's how they look, I would think, is when they're observing something. Other, other than for the hardcore metropolitan areas, the Sasquatch sightings are almost directly correlated with population density. So it's not really where the Sasquatches are, but where we are to see them. For all we know, they might be all over, except we're not there. Especially when up there in the middle of the night with night vision equipment. Yeah, if you determine the uh, uh, possible past changes in the environment, uh, vegetative cover and whatnot, and food and uh, burial, physical barriers and whatnot, and distribution factors, is limiting by what barriers? Uh, so that's why she hasn't got any barriers on the land to speak of, except uh, places of cities where the where humans have just taken up square miles of city, that's the only barrier there is to him anymore. And because the mountains are no barrier, he can climb. They've been observed climbing up sheer cliffs. And I followed a track over the palace and went to a drop-off. It was straight down, but I didn't go down there. I went around and by, got in there to see where he went. Found one track, one track in the dust, that's all. But the, the scuff marks on the talus told me where he went, you know. There was spaces of the stuff. The pace was four to four feet, even five feet. So he was taking a pretty good little walk across there. And he went down that straight bluff. wasn't very far down there, but you know, he didn't jump down there. He was just to crawl down there or something. It's curious that uh, the Bluff Creek uh, Patterson film in '67 was that was kind of a new area that they built roads in there. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of a new area. See, that a brand new area like that that was opening, being opened up by loggers. Um, got into that area with this family of Sasquatches. Of course, right away they were in the dust. Every morning there was fresh tracks of dust on those logging roads. And uh, actually, uh, one company lost the loggers quit. They quit working. They got so they got so long, long, long out of their mind. And then I've been pulled up. The Alp, where uh, the, the screams were recorded in the 70s, uh, that was a, a newly developed uh, subdivision that spread out in the woods, and they got a lot of calls there. And also in Skamania County, uh, in the 60s and 70s, there was a, a new uh, set of areas opened up for uh, subdivision. That's a that's a situation that really uh, strikes me, the Puyallup area, because I was raised eight miles from there, and I knew the country pretty well as a kid. I was fishing all the time around. All the time. I never even heard of Sasquatch. Here, here in the 70s, it was the 1970s when that happened. Uh, the Sasquatch is reserved with the city police, and state patrol, and farmers, and residents. And a lot of people saw these critters. And uh, that might have been a recolonization situation where uh, it's been logged off before my time. And then they came back in the brush and uh, Time I was there, was coming back in the brush, getting real thick, and uh, and then all of a sudden houses started spreading out from Puyallup and were going up the hillside there, and they were, oh, gee, they got a mall up there, top of the, top of the hill now, a shopping mall, 
So, and uh, the problem with the bus release has increased 10,000 units since I was around that part of the country. Uh, two animals had to be evicted. They came in there somehow because they weren't living on the kid, I know that. Uh, I think the, the most obvious the, the disturbance we've ever had in the last hundred years is logging. Uh, that would change everything so drastically that uh, these animals may be all over the place where they weren't before. Their uh, distribution pattern is now so different. And uh, the good feeding grounds are in different places. And uh, people can see them, these logging roads going through all of them. And what's the wrong thing you see the south point. Yeah, you said that too. How can they not leave the track? Track? Yeah, you said that sometimes they don't leave tracks. How can something that weighs that? Well, that's, that's a good question because I can't hardly feature it myself. But the, the tracks I follow, they started abruptly and they ended abruptly on moss. And you know, you can walk on moss and it springs back in place again, yeah. and you won't leave the track. Uh, Grover Cran speculates that they might very well be aware of their own tracks for territorial purposes. And the reason he uh, speculates on that, that for a while there were, I think, uh, distinctive tracks of four Sasquatches in the Blue Mountains that they would see once in a blue moon. And then apparently a new track appeared, which appeared regularly in very exposed locations along the tops of ridges and places where the tracks were very, uh, very easily seen. And uh, also he said, uh, more than once you find a track that is so perfectly placed into a suitable substrate that you, your first thought would be, well, somebody came here with his uh, footprint machine and put it right there in the best place. But he said that there are many occasions where, where that does not pertain. And he, he uh, speculated that on that occasion, it was a Sasquatch that was entering a new territory and was sort of leaving his mark of all. As, as, as a final statement, I'd like to say that uh, 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 George Schaller put it down real good in his book on the study of gorilla. He says that distribution of an animal is a dynamic phenomenon is undoubtedly determined by a combination of physical and environmental factors operating through time. Uh, and that probably could apply to the Sasquatch, too. We are talking about secondary forest. Schaller mentions that the, the favorite habitat of the gorilla is secondary forest. There's more food there. And it's vegetarian. But that being that the, the Bigfoot's not a vegetarian, he's an omnivorous animal like we are, uh, he's better off too in secondary forest because there's more meat there than there is in the other kind of forest. And uh, so this. Uh, rings true. The population units presumably drift or, or are uh, uh, pushed by the local conditions change. Possibly the effects of man made disturbances of influence and distribution of Sasquatch. And uh, of course, over the centuries, the same thing was probably taking place in Europe and Asia. People were exploding in the population. And Drifting around, they force these animals in the back country to the hard to live countries. Jim, how, how could this be uh, the same creature that was uh, the track in the Patterson film? The Patterson film looks like just a huge person. Like you see, that's what this is a lot different. Yeah, you see, this is a 16 inch track, really, but the only, the only part of it shows. The animal put all his weight on his toes, and the heel didn't, didn't mark. He was supposed to be down here at this mark. Now here's the, here's the other one. Now here's the same foot with a full weight distributed about the toe of the heel. Now you see the difference? And it's spread out. They're real flexible. It spread its toes three inches wider than they are in this bit. You wouldn't think it was the same animal. You know, if you were out there and saw this track, you didn't see that one. You saw that one later on, you put two animals in. It's the same animal. And, uh, Big toe and the little toe, and that was difference in size. What is that? Same way on this one. There's a lot of variation in, in footprints. There's a lot of variation in human footprints. Some people have big toes that are real big. And some of these animals are 
has been uh, had the footprint of <coughs> me, and it shows a huge big toe. The Patterson, the Patterson footprint is not too big. Sorry. Okay. That's, I mean, I wanted to show that because it shows the flexibility of the toes. I mean, they can really spread them out like hands. That's why they can climb so good and scale the mountains. Uh, is that about it? Any questions more? Okay. We might, I fully anticipate the class could possibly go to 9 and 10. I don't know how you all feel about that. But uh, brought it on speaking class. Uh, thank you very much, Jim.